introduction. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining the Hudson Library and Historical Society's live virtual event with Stacey Vanek Smith, host of The Indicator from NPR's Planet Money and author of Machiavelli for Women. Stacey Vanek Smith is the keynote speaker for the ninth annual Global Entrepreneurship Week in Hudson, a citywide celebration of entrepreneurship. Global Entrepreneurship and the Hudson Library's Entrepreneurship Series are generously sponsored by the Burton D. Morgan Foundation. We are very grateful for their support to make programs like this one possible. Ms. Vanek Smith's books available for purchase from Hudson's independent bookstore, The Learned Owl. We will put a link in the chat for purchase information. And as always, questions for the author are welcome and encouraged at any time during the discussion. Type your question into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to questions as time allows. It's my honor and privilege to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Stacey Vanek Smith is a longtime public radio reporter and host. She currently hosts NPR's The Indicator from Planet Money, a daily podcast covering business and economics. She's also served as a correspondent and host for NPR's Planet Money and Marketplace. A native of Idaho, Smith is a graduate of Princeton University where she earned a BA in comparative literature and creative writing. She also holds an MS in journalism from Columbia University. Stacy, welcome. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk for a little chunk of time just about the origin of the book and kind of what the book is about. And then I uh, am very happy to open it up to questions. And please feel free to ask me anything you like, because I feel like I have spent pretty much all day, every day for the last 15 years asking people about money. So it feels only karmically appropriate that I have to answer whatever questions you throw at me. Um, so the book came from, so for about the last 15 years, I've covered um, the economy, business and economics for, um, cert, for first for marketplace and then for planet money and the indicator, but always business and economics. And one of the things that happens when you cover that uh, the same beat uh, for so long is that the same stories kind of come up again and again. You start to see patterns. And one of the, the stories that I did quite often, probably every couple of years, was about the gender pay gap. There was always there's a gender pay gap month. It's in March. Um, and I was interviewing an economist uh, about the gender pay gap. Uh, Francine, Dr. Francine Blau, she's wonderful research. And she just kind of tossed off this comment. She said, oh, well, you know, the numbers haven't really changed in 20 years. And I remember just, I remember the moment. I remember exactly where I was standing because, I mean, I've covered the economy for 15 years and I've seen so much transformation and so much dynamism and so much change. And, you know, women and people of color and other marginalized workers like breaking into new fields and starting businesses. And I just couldn't believe that the data had been stuck for that long. So I started talking with her more about it. Um, and the data is that women earn about <clears throat> 80 cents on the dollar compared to men. For black women, it's 63 cents. For uh, Lat Latina women, it's 55 cents. 55 cents on the dollar. And I couldn't believe that those numbers had not moved in two decades. And, and uh, Dr. Blau said, well, they really haven't moved in 10 years. So this was sort of circling around in my head. And another one of the kind of semi-perennial stories came up, which was CEOs. And um, it was the share of CEOs. I think CEOs are 80% male and 90% white. And for Fortune 500 companies, um, it's even whiter and more male. So basically the more money a company has, the whiter and more male its leadership is. And those numbers, those numbers also had not changed in, in 10 years. So I just, I, I couldn't quite let the, those facts just weren't settled in my head. And I was talking to my editor, Karen Marcus at, at um, Simon and Schuster, and we were talking this through and I was telling her about this data and she said, you know, I, she's like, I really think women need like Machiavelli or something. And this light went off in my head. Um, 
And I bought a copy of The Prince <laughs> and I read it in a coffee shop that weekend. It's a very short book. It's only about 50 pages. And the second I started reading it, I, I felt like this was, I knew that this was the right fit for, I knew this was the, the way that I was going to sort of explore this big question that was in my mind and that had come from so many years of reporting, but also how I was going to approach hopefully navigate, helping people to navigate this because I've read a lot of, a lot of research, a lot of studies about uh, gender discrimination and, and other kinds of discrimination. And a lot of times there are policy recommendations at the end of the papers, like there will be recommendations for, for companies or uh, most often for government policy. And the th uh, something always frustrated me about that because it made me feel like I didn't, I was like, well, what happens if you don't have a, like, I don't, I mean, I guess I can elect officials who will hopefully enact the policies I want, but I don't really have direct, uh, you know, effect on policy. And what if you're at a company that isn't, you know, isn't doing what it's supposed to do, or maybe is trying to do what it's supposed to do, but it's not working. Um, and there just wasn't really advice for individuals. And I, I had read because I am a person who does a lot of homework. Uh, so when I was asking for raises, which is just a very uncomfortable thing for me and the way I tend to handle discomfort is homework. <laughs> so I would read books um, like negotiation books, both um, just straightforward negotiation books and, and negotiation books aimed towards women. And the negotiation books that were aimed towards women, I always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I always thought the tone felt a little like, you go girl and like, you go get yours. And I didn't relate to that. Um, like the girl boss thing. I just, it didn't work really that well for me, but the regular negotiation advice definitely didn't work. I had a couple of like super disastrous um, attempted negotiations, which now I'm grateful for because it made for good stories in the book, but at the time they were very crushing. Um, and so this was kind of also in my head as I was reading Machiavelli. And what I liked about Machiavelli, so I had read it in college as part of a, a political science class, and I really hated it. I thought it was terrible. I thought Machiavelli was awful. I was like, I don't care about power or crushing people. Like I have no interest in these things. Um, but when I reread it, it was a completely different experience. For one thing, the, the book starts out with an apology. It is like addressed to Lorenzo de' Medici. And it's basically like, I'm not worthy of your time, but if you have a second, you know, maybe you could just take a second to read like my life's work, the best I have inside of me. If you could take a second and glance at that, that would be amazing. I'm terrible. You're wonderful. It was just a very strange way to start a book that is sort of famously about being ruthless manipulative power monger. So at first I was just very confused. And then I started reading the advice itself and Machiavelli in the Prince, he lays out in the very beginning of the Prince, he says, there are two kinds of princes. There is the inheriting Prince who is basically kind of whatever, taking over his father's kingdom. Um, and there is the conquering Prince who is sort of taken a land by force or taken over a new land. And he said, for inheriting princes, things are pretty cushy. Um, people know his family. He's kind of expected. He is the status quo. But he says, for, for conquering princes, he says, difficulties abound. He says, it's very difficult. People are skeptical of you. Like, why should we pay taxes to you? Who are you? Why should you be in power? Why do you get to be in power? And people are sort of trying to destabilize them, take power from him. He's in a tricky position. And I thought this was a perfect proxy for women and other marginalized workers in the workplace. Like people are there, they are in the workplace, but they are being blocked and destabilized and they're not reaching the sort of heights of, um, well, I would not just, but heights of like, I guess the corporate world of venture capital of any of those things, they're not getting the, the rewards that they should. And I know from my research how the consequences of this, and they're very serious. Um, 
Women retire, I think, with a third the savings that men have. Women often tend to live longer. Um, and so women end up in just with terrible rates of poverty in retirement. And it's especially true for women of color. Uh, LGBTQ workers, terrible rates of unemployment and poverty and report hu huge amounts of harassment. And I mean, and also a lot of, of, of women are single parents. And so they're in, in very difficult financial situations. So I felt like the stakes were high and I wanted to be able to offer advice. So I looked at a lot of the economic research that I look at for work. And a lot of the studies do offer solutions and ways forward. And I was so excited about that, some of the research I found. And I, some of the research was quite uncomfortable because I, I made a promise to myself that I would tell the truth as much as I could and everything would be backed up by research and data. And I would try to find a way through. And this gets, you know, things get very tricky for women. For instance, um, take asking for a raise. So the pay gap, obviously part of getting higher pay is asking for a raise. And women ask for a raise of one fifth as often as men do. So that would seem to indicate that women are kind of failing or responsible for the gender pay gap. Um, and actually I was talking to Dr. Linda Babcock who did a lot of this research and um, very famously her study came out about how women negotiate so much uh, less frequently than men do. And she said, one of her students called her up, she's at Carnegie Mellon and said, oh my gosh, you're on the radio. Rush Limbaugh is talking about you on the radio. And she turned on the radio and she said, Rush Limbaugh was saying like, uh, saying about her, he's like, this is, you know, everybody, women often talk about the gender pay gap, but the only reason there's a gender pay gap is that women aren't asking. And she said, um, I kind of wanted to put my head in an oven. <laughs> uh, and, and she said, you know, the point she made was that if, um, if Rush had read a little further into her work, the reason women don't ask is really interesting. The reason women don't ask is something that a lot of researchers call the double bind. And what's going on there is people have a very different reaction when a woman asks for a raise than they do when a man asks for a raise. And the same holds true for people of color and LGBTQ workers. When you ask for more, even if you use the same words, it can be perceived very differently. And women run into this issue because of kind of our unconscious archetypes that we associate with women and men and leaders. And, you know, they're, they're often unconscious, which makes it a very tricky problem to address because I think a lot of discrimination comes from people who absolutely don't mean to discriminate and don't think they are discriminating. A lot of times it comes in the form of like a gut feeling or just feeling like, you know, Jerry's a little more ready for a promotion than Sue or whatever it is. Um, and so I wanted to sort of dive into the double bind. And in essence, what happens is for women, um, people associate like the archetypal woman with being um, compassionate, sympathetic, modest, not asking a lot for herself. And the archetypal leader is bold, asks for more, doesn't care too much what other people think, is aggressive. And so what happens when women ask for a raise or push for promotion or are in a leadership position is they encounter this double bind, which is if they display a lot of feminine qualities, i.e. they're very gentle and compassionate and hang back and don't ask too much for themselves, they will generally be very liked. Like people will think very highly of them, but they will not get leadership positions. And obviously if you're being the archetypal woman, you're not asking for a raise. If women display characteristics that are associated with, with leaders, um, you know, you ask for more, you're aggressive, you're don't care too much what other people think you're trying to get yours. Um, you might get a promotion or a leadership position or a raise, but people will not like you. They'll think often people will have a reaction of like this person's pushy, this person's selfish. She's so grabby. And so when women ask for more in a, in a, like a raise situation or any other situation, um, there's often backlash. I mean, we see this, I think a lot of times with female politicians, people have very sort of emotional outsized reactions. Like they're not, they're not supposed to like, this isn't right. Women aren't supposed to like, they're not acting the way they're supposed to act. 
Um, and so that can put women in a really tricky situation. So when women ask for more money, there is backlash. Um, there are studies that show that women, a woman who asks for more money in a negotiation is automatically considered to be less desirable to work with. Um, and so even if you, let's say you get a raise of a couple thousand dollars, that could hold you back later on when a manager is thinking about who to promote or make a project leader. And it's like, I don't know, like Sue's fine. She's just a little prickly or whatever it is. So I think when women don't ask for raises or push for promotions, it's often quite a logical decision because the upside is very uncertain and the downside is very certain. So in a certain way, it's like a very, it's a very logical and smart decision to not ask for more if you're a woman. Um, but of course, like the consequences of not asking for more are really serious. So I tried to find ways, and there's been a lot of really amazing research about this. Uh, I tried to find ways to ask for more that would minimize the backlash that women often receive. Um, and one of the ways I found was something that management consultants delightfully call transformational leadership. Um, transformational leadership, this is in the context of like how, basically how do women lead in a situation where people feel like a woman giving order, people have negative reactions to a woman giving orders. And, and it also, I think, is exactly the same thing if women are sort of asking for a raise, uh, asking for more for themselves. And the reaction can be sort of negative, but in, in the case of transformational leadership, what you do is it's all about not having an adversarial interaction, but having a collaborative interaction, emphasizing the we. In the case of asking for a raise, this is something like, you know, I let's say, you know, you're earning $60,000. You find out that Ralph, your really lazy coworker who has less experience than you is making $70,000. Um, and it's very upsetting. So the first thing I would recommend is like to let the emotion settle because I think it, one of Machiavelli's biggest pieces of advice is basically to be very logical. In fact, I think the reason that his book has endured for so long and the reason he is such a scandalous, uh, a scandalous figure, it's the same thing. Um, I think in his book, he sort of removes emotion and morality from situations and he looks at everything logically and analytically like a chessboard. So it makes his advice very timeless. It's not filtered through like the mores of the day or the morals of the day um, or any, any ethics at all. I mean, one of the pieces of advice he gives is like, if you wrong someone, you should probably kill them and their whole family so there's not like people plotting revenge, which is solid advice, but it's like horrible. Uh, on the other hand, it's a lot of his advice is very wise, very, um, very analytical man. He was a, essentially the secretary of state for Florence uh, was his job. And so if you're asking for a raise, for instance, you know, you go into your boss's office and you want to be like, I can't believe you're paying Randy $70,000. What is wrong with you? This is completely messed up. You know, I work harder than he does. You know, I have more experience than he does. Of course, this is like what you want to say. And I have said these things. Uh, it, it, there was a circumstance when I essentially said that. Um, I wish I hadn't, I wish, but I hadn't read Machiavelli yet. I didn't know. Um, but I think a, a more effective way to approach that situation would, would be to say, um, would be to think about what you want. And let's say there's like a, a promotion you want or a project you want to be working on. You can say something like, you know, I'm really, I love my work at this company. I'm really excited to be here. I see the work you're doing on, you know, this X project, and I would love to be a part of it. I find it so inspiring. I love that I'm at a company that does this kind of work. Um, and I'm very proud of the work I've been doing lately. My productivity is up 20% over last year. I'm the most productive member of my team. Um, I did want to talk about my salary. Uh, I've done a lot of market research, both in the company and, and also outside of the company. And I know um, that the salary range for my position is between about $60,000 and $80,000. Uh, I think when I started, a salary of 60 was appropriate, but now that I have more experience and, you know, have, I think showed a lot of progress in the workplace, I feel like a salary of 80 is probably more appropriate. I know that's at the top of the range, but I feel like I've been performing at the top of the range. And I think that would sort of put me where I need to be in terms of the work that I'm doing now. What do you think? And I think that is a more productive approach and it minimizes backlash by 
kind of painting a picture of like, you and I can go here together. Like, here's what we can do together at this company. And similarly in transformational leadership. Um, so people don't mind. In my book, I call this the Aaron Brockovich exception. So people don't mind if women are pushy and grabby and aggressive, as long as it's on behalf of someone else. If you're pushing for someone else as a woman, people admire it. It very much fits in with the archetypal woman. And so what you do as a female manager is you turn the team into like another person. So you're like, listen, I don't want to ask you guys to stay late, but I know the work, the work that this amazing team is capable of. And I can't let us represent anything than our, like, uh, and then our very best. And so like, Jerry, I'm going to need you to stay late. And Tina, I'm going to need you to like really step up your work because I know that this team is so important to me and I know the work we do is so great. So that's transformational leadership. And um, one of the bonuses of transformational leadership is that it has been shown to be a more effective way of motivating people. Um, when gender aside, people like, workers like transformational leadership. They like feeling like part of something. They like feeling like a collective rather than sort of a general patent style, you will execute my orders um, situation. Uh, and that can work quite effectively for men. It does not tend to work very effectively for women, according to the research. Um, and so that is an example of some of the issues I was grappling with and some of the research that I used and found um, in, in the book. And um, it was an amazing it was an amazing journey. It was amazing to have the chance to really delve into something. Cause as a reporter, I'm always jumping from subject. I mean, I'm always, it's always business and economics, but you know, one day it's like airline profits and another day it's like the price of eggs. And um, so it was nice to really drill down in something and get to spend some time there. And then I also talked to just a lot of really amazing women, um, took time, women in all different fields all across the country uh, took, took time to talk with me, including Janet Yellen, which uh, as a business and economics reporter was, um, I, I, I think I came about as close to passing out as I've ever come. I think I tried to keep my cool. Luckily it was over the phone and this was before the age of the Zoom call. So she couldn't see me. Um, thank goodness, because otherwise I think I really would have, I think I really would have lost it. But um, anyway, but so many women uh, shared their stories with me and shared amazing advice with me. And it, it was just, it was such a wonderful experience for me to work on this book. And it's a pretty amazing to see it out in the world and, and out in the world at a time that I feel is so important for women. I mean, obviously women dropping out of the workforce for childcare has been a huge story. And work changing so much for all of us, for every person, no matter what your job, it's changed somehow because of the pandemic and so much happening. But I do really think this is a moment of such amazing opportunity for workers and especially for women. Um, not only because I think I've never seen a moment when workers have had as much power as they do now. Employers are desperate to hire, desperate to keep the workers they have. Wages are rising. Workplaces are getting more accommodating. Uh, one of the things that has really kept women out of the workforce or held them back or even accounts for an enormous part of the gender pay gap is child care, women taking part-time work instead of full-time work to care for children or even choosing careers or jobs within careers that can help accommodate child and family care. And I think we're finally at a moment when the workplace has become more flexible, a lot of workplaces by necessity, so things have moved remote. And I think a lot of the stigma around online work or remote work has been removed and I think that flexibility going forward is going to be particularly important for women. And so I'm very excited and very hopeful about this moment, uh, even as it's been a really horrible time for all of us. And, and even as so many women have dropped out of the workforce, I think we lost 30 years of progress during COVID. A lot of that's come back. Um, but I am really hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful for the future. And I hope that my book can be helpful um, to people navigating our brave new employment world, uh, which I've been um, covering a lot the last couple of weeks, the unemployment numbers came out and then we have the quit, the rate quits rate coming out tomorrow. So it's all been looming very large in my mind. Um, but yeah, I'd love, I'd love to open it up to questions, see what people want to know. Uh, I'm happy to answer any and all questions and thoughts.
Yeah, so we will give everyone a chance to put your questions in the Q&A down below. Um, I have some questions while we're waiting. Um, so what I really, and by the, by the way, everybody, this book is wonderful. Please do go out and get it. Copies are available at the Learned Owl. We have a link in the chat for it. Um, I was talking to Stacy ahead, you know, before this, just telling her how much I, I've read a lot of, you know, books like this. And this one was just so relatable. Um, I, you know, there's some humor in it. I really appreciated it. Um, and I think what I really appreciated about the book is that not only do you include anecdotes and stories, but you also have a ton of research. So is there any research that just like you, that surprised you? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the research, like I had this reaction with a lot of the research of like simultaneous relief and horror. So like the, let's take the raise thing. So I've spent a lot of, lot of years beating myself up for not asking for raises more often or finding out I was getting paid less than someone else. And like, why can't I ask for a raise? I'm so bad at asking for raises. And why can't I push for myself? And it was when I started reading the research about, um, about pay, about backlash. And there was one study that, that showed that women who asked for, uh, asked for a raise. Yeah. were considered less desirable to work with. And there was one amazing piece of information. I think this was probably something that research that came back into my head, probably a thousand times while I was writing the book. Uh, and it had to do with just the, how different perceptions can be when the same words come from a person who looks different. There was one pretty genius study. I think it was from Dr. Cecilia Ridgway at Stanford, but she, um, basically had a script that she wrote out of someone um, basically selling themselves in a, in a job uh, interview situation. Be like, this is why you should hire me. I'm amazing kind of a thing. So she had a male actor and a female actor read the script. And when the male actor read the script, people thought like, you know, this guy, I like this guy. He's very confident. Like, let's, you know, I'd like to work with this guy. I feel like he'd be fun, like fun to have around and fun to work with. And when the woman said the same words, the reaction was very different. People were like, she's awful. I wouldn't want to work with her. She seems really selfish. Um, apparent, someone said like, I don't think she, she seems like she doesn't have any friends. Um, and it was the same words. And I think I, I came back to that again and again, um, because so much of the research and even the advice I gave sometimes was hard for me to give. It wasn't advice I felt great about, um, which was essentially like, you know, put your anger aside and like try to collaborate with the person who's paying you 20% less than Ra like Ralph, the lazy coworker. Um, that's not very satisfying advice. It feels like unjust in certain ways, but I kept coming back to like, I wanted it to work. I wanted to give people advice that would work. I wanted to get more money to women. My mind came back to the data that started this whole project the, you know, the gender pay gap, the CEO gap. I was like, okay, I just, I want to give advice that works, even if, even if it's uncomfortable, which a lot of times it was. For sure. And then, and then you also had so many stories from women that you spoke with. Were there any stories that just really stood out to you that were just, you know, I know Janet Yellen. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, that were inspiring or... Um, there were so many good stories in the book that, you know, one piece of advice that I, I loved is so simple, but I think it was, there's so much wisdom in it. It came from this woman, uh, Neha Narkede. She's a Silicon Valley unicorn. So she founded this company called Confluent, which is worth many billions of dollars. Um, but before that she worked her way up at LinkedIn. So she had also kind of navigated corporate America. And so I was asking her something like, oh, how do you ask for more? Or how do you ask for a raise? And she said, you know, it's very difficult always. She's like, but I just got to a place where like, I wasn't afraid to hear no. I got excited when I would hear no. And the reason she said she would get excited is that then she could ask why. So if you say like, I really think I should be promoted to whatever vice president of phones or something. And they're like, oh, I don't think you're ready for that. Then she said she would get exactly, she's like, okay, great. Well, what do you need to see from me to get that promotion? Like, I'm so interested in it. I'd love to move up at this company. Like, what would you need to see from me that you're not seeing? She said, A, she would get really great feedback. 
Um, and B, should we get concrete things like very, very concrete, like your productivity has to go up by 5%. We need to see X, Y, and Z from you. And then she said she would go and she would do all the things on the list and she would come back and say, great. Well, I did everything you suggested. So how about my raise or promotion? And she said that actually was effective a lot of the time because a lot of discrimination happens in this kind of nebulous kind of like, I don't know, do you think she's ready for promotion? But if you make somebody articulate, listen, what do you need to see for me to get this raise? Then it, it removes a lot of that. And then the person's looking at their own, uh, you know, own standards that they set out. So it's much different to be like, oh yeah, you did all the things I asked you to, but no. And she said sometimes that did happen. And she would just know then that this was not a place where she could advance. She didn't have a future there. So I thought that was just really, really smart advice. And also I liked the idea, her approach of being like, I feel like often when I want a promotion or a job, I feel this sort of self-righteousness about it, which is really just probably just masking insecurity, but I'm like angry. I'm like, I need to be this, like you should promote me. I remember I spent like a year of my life trying to get promoted to reporter two and like just so many sleepless nights, tossing and turning. I'm like, I, I've been, I should be a reporter too. I can't believe that guy's a reporter too. And it's, you know, the whole thing. And it's ridiculous. I don't even remember what the difference was or why I was so upset. Um, but if I just gone into my boss and been like, great, what do you need to see from me? I'd love to be a reporter too. That's such a valuable conversation. You get so much information from that. You start to get to know what the person is looking for. I don't know. I just, I loved that. It seemed so productive and so easy. It sounded so easy, like so chill at a moment that I have always felt so fraught in. So I really loved that advice. We're starting to get a lot of questions in. So I want to turn to those from the audience. So you mentioned this throughout and you said you kind of cringed yourself giving some advice. Amber wants to know what was the least satisfying advice for you to give in the book? Oh God. (laughs) No, I, I know exactly what it is. It was, um, so one of the, the chapters is about motherhood. And so the statistics around motherhood, those really shocked me um, because I feel like discrimination around mothers, like it's not as reported on. I think it's, it's there's just less, there are less tools for people, but the effects are amazing. The gen, The pay gap between mothers and women without children is bigger than the gender pay gap. When women have children, their work is looked at more critically. They are less likely to be promoted. Their people tend to, like their esteem of this person goes down. They automatically assume that they're less dedicated to their work, that they're not serious. It's just like a very harrowing uh, series. And, And a lot of women end up leaving the workforce. This is so destructive because basically what happens is people assume that once women have children, it's like, oh, well, this is your real, this is like kind of the role that you're meant for. So work is kind of a hobby, right? Like now now work is sort of like your side hustle and your real job is raising children. And they sort of assume often that there's a a man providing a lot of money. And that, so it's like, well, you don't really need the money. So all of these assumptions are going on. And of course, the worst part is the assumptions are often made. A lot of the discrimination happens under the skies of being helpful. So it's like, you know, let's not put Gina on this really like high profile project. She just had a baby. Let's give her a break. And so mommy tracking happens, but it happens under the guise of people trying to be helpful and supportive and thoughtful. And so it's really, really hard to deal with. But basically, women end up leaving what happens is a lot of women get discouraged. They end up leaving the workforce. And then it's really, really, really hard to come back to work um, after you leave. There's this effect economists called, call scarring. And basically you lose your contacts, you know, and even it's like ridiculously, even though like most women have children at some point in their lives, somehow the workplace seems like shocked by all this. And if you have a gap in your resume, employers are like, well, I mean, it's like really, really hard to recover from a gap in your resume. Um, And so women are lose years of pay and promotion. um, And it's, it's just a, it's a really serious issue. So, oh, I looked and looked and looked for research on like, because I really wanted to offer advice. And basically the advice was I called Dr. Cecilia Ridgway. She's done a ton of um, 
of research into like discrimination against mothers. <laughs> and the discrim and basically she said, you don't, well, some of it's very practical, right? You meet with your manager before you go on maternity leave and you make it really clear that you, you know, you talk about when you get back and you basically treat it as if you're going on vacation. So you're sort of sending a message like, I'm coming back. So yeah, I'm going to be back. You know, I'm coming back on April 13th and I was going to, I was going to hopefully dive back into this project and this project and this project and just sort of try not to let them slot you into sort of the mom, mommy trap. Um, the other pieces of advice were very uncomfortable, especially since I don't have children. So I felt really monstrous giving them. Like I, I, I felt like I, a, a terrible person, but, but the research is like not mentioning your child is a good idea. Like if you talk about your baby and you show baby pictures, it will probably compound the problem. People will be like, oh, right. She has a baby. We should keep her off of this project. Um, another thing is to work. You have to work like as hard as you can, basically right when you come back from maternity leave, when you're exhausted and not sleeping and dealing with this like little munchkin who's in the middle of your life, changing everything. Um, you have to work really hard because that's the moment when people will be like, oh yeah, yeah, she's not really, she's not really serious anymore. Um, which is, I mean, I hated giving that advice. It was, it was terrible. Um, but then there was other advice. There was this woman, Dr. Isabel Escobar, who's a chemical engineer. And she said that one of her coworkers said, um, people are going to, she, she adopted a, a little girl and she said, people are going to tell you that you shouldn't be on pro. She said she'd always been sort of the department workhorse. She teaches at a university. And she said one of her coworkers was like, people are going to tell you, you shouldn't take on as much work. And she, and so what this person recommended to, to Isabel was to say, um, so the guy was like, you know, you really shouldn't be spending so much time on this project because, you know, you just had a baby and being a mother is the most important job in the world. And so Dr. Escobar said, you know, I really appreciate your concern, but um, this is my family and please, uh, I'd really appreciate it if you let me, me make my like decisions with my family that are the best for my family. But that is not a comfortable thing to say. And of course, I'm sure the person saying it thought they were being like, really wonderful. Like, listen, you don't have to work this hard anymore. Like you should enjoy being a mom. And that seems kind of nice. And it seems like a harsh reaction to sort of a gentle comment, but she said it really felt sort of insidious. So she learned to do that too. But I think it's really hard. And, and, you know, if the pandemic has shown us anything as, as well as a bunch of studies, women still do the lion's share of childcare, even in, in, um, in mixed gender couples where both people work full time, a lot of it just, ends up falling to the woman a little more. So, um, so yeah, that was definitely the advice that was just, I just, I still don't feel good about it. As you can tell, I'm just like talking and talking. I don't feel great about it. I still don't feel great about it, but it was the best advice that I had. And it was the best advice that I had. Um, we had someone who said this book is so necessary. I've re received so much advice from well-meaning male mentors and even my husband that just didn't work. And they seem stumped or in disbelief that their advice didn't work. To me, men need to read this book as much, if not more than women. What has been the reaction to your book been from men? You know, it's actually been very positive. Um, some of the kindest, nicest things people have said, I mean, a lot of um a lot of the people that I've worked with over the years are, I mean, economics is about 75% male. So a lot of the economists I talk to are male and have worked with over so many years. And people have been really wonderful, actually, like really supportive and wonderful. And a lot of men, especially, have been really wonderful. And um, when I, I only did one in-person event, because everything's been virtual, but I did one in-person event in, in Brooklyn and I did it with uh, Cardiff Garcia, who's my co-host at The Indicator. And um, I, I, I worked with him closely for so long and I was so glad that he could be a part of it. But the other reason I wanted him to be a part of it was like, I, I, this conversation is not gonna have any meaning if it's just women who are having it. Um, everybody needs to be at the table talking about this. The same with diversity and inclusion of all kinds. I feel like it's so important to have everybody at the table talking about this and for everybody to feel invited and part of the conversation. Uh, and I tried to do that with my book. Um, I didn't want it to feel exclusionary, you know, or 
I, I didn't want to write a book that felt like, you know, men couldn't read it and enjoy it. Um, that's not the point of, of what I was trying to do. So yes, as, I hope, I hope men can read it and get something out of it. People have been very supportive. Men have been very, very supportive. Um, we have a lot of questions. Okay. I'm so glad people are asking so many good questions. Okay. So you have a whole section in here on negotiation and we do have a lot of people asking about that. Um, so I might kind of lump them all together. Um, so someone says, I find it very challenging to find accurate comparative salary information and talking to people about what they make is difficult. What strategies can you share about finding out what an appropriate salary, what is an appropriate salary to ask for? Yes, this is the most important thing I think in, in asking for a raise is this homework because it really gives you the in underpinnings to know how much you should be asking for. And um, there's a great book called Negotiation Genius and in it, but two scholars from Harvard. And one of the things they say is if you do more research, people will just be less likely to mess with you. Like you don't even have to say that you've done the research. You just come off differently. And I really think that's true. It's like you're putting out a sort of like, don't even think about it energy. Um, so asking about money, this, I feel so excited to answer this question because this is all I've been doing for many years. Um, there are a few ways. Uh, the first one is to ask your colleagues and the people who used to have your job. So the easiest thing is to ask people who used to have your job or used to work at your company. Hey, and what you say is, for some reason, the word range is like magical when it comes to money. So instead of being like, what do you make? Be like, what was the salary range for your position when you were there? Um, and just explain to people, I feel like when everybody, almost everybody hates negotiating. People are so empathetic. So I think if you say, listen, I'm about to go into a job negotiation. I'm asking for a raise. I'm a little lost. I'm afraid I'm being underpaid. And one thing you can do is, you know, be like, I'm making, you know, right now I'm making like $70,000, but I feel like that's really low. Uh, if you wouldn't mind telling me your salary range, like the salary range for like the job or what the salary, your salary range, I'd so appreciate it. It'd be so helpful. Um, people are very generous. And I think people get excited because it's a way they can help. Uh, one of my friends says she has started reaching out to white men on LinkedIn because like, cause one of the things that's important to do is not just look at your company, but look at other companies, because then you can say, you know, listen, I've done market research. I know what this work pays on the market and other companies might be paying a lot more. If you're at a company that's underpaying people, like you don't want to just be the best of the underpaid or the least underpaid. So she says she reaches out to a lot of white men on LinkedIn and she'll be like, Hey, uh, I noticed we have the same job title. I'm asking for a raise. I have no idea what I'm doing. Would you mind telling me the salary range for your job? And she said the response rate has been like 80%. People are so excited to help. She said, some people have even said, Oh my gosh, I'm going to ask all my colleagues and give like, they've done reporting in their workplace and gotten a range of salaries for that. So that's a really good way. Um, yes, people who used to have your job will be very relaxed about it. People who used to manage for that position, you can call HR or a union rep. They will give you salary bans if you're in a union job or HR. Sometimes they'll be like, what is the official salary range for this position? Um, that's really great. Glassdoor does have some good stuff. I mean, you can find some, some good information online, especially now, uh, because a lot of places will post jobs. And I know if they post them in like Colorado, they have to publish the salary range. So you can do a job search for Colorado for whatever your job is. I feel like it's much easier to find stuff online now, but I do feel like the in-person is better. And then you come, you come with the facts, you know, you come with the facts. You're like, listen, I've done a lot of market research in this company and outside of this company. I know this work tends to pay X. And it's important to me to get at the top of that salary range because of X, Y, and Z. And you sort of tell your story. But so those are my recommendations. I hope that's helpful. But yeah, the word salary range and just leveling with people. I mean, if someone comes to you and they're like, I'm asking for a raise, I'm terrible at this. I feel like I might be really underpaid. And I, you know, it's important to me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make more money. Like, do you have any advice? Is there anyone I should talk to? Would you mind telling me your salary range? Anything would be helpful. Let's see. Um, we have someone who 
has been in the corporate world for 45 years and passed over for significant promotions often, off, always losing up to men who are less qualified and much less productive. Great resume, master's and a doctorate, and lost the big opportunity to a man who was, quote, well-connected and had no college education. I'm now looking at retirement and seeking a board role and find, once again, men are dominating the boardroom. Any advice for women who have paid their dues and still finding boardroom doors locked shut? Yes, this is a huge problem. But I think this is a moment um, because people are, like, boards are diversifying. Companies are... <laughs> Unfortunately, one of the things that moves the needles in these things are uh, optics. So do companies really care about diversity and inclusion? I don't know. I don't want to be cynical, but they definitely want to look like they care. That I know. So I think that could be an effective approach um, to reach out to a company and say something like, I really love what you guys do. I'm so I would be so excited at the prospect of being on the board of this company. Um, I know that diversity and inclusion is so important at your company. I know that's one of your core values. Um, I know that you've, you're making an effort to diversify your board. So you're not exactly accusing them of not having a diverse board, but you're sort of pointing it out. It'd be like, I know, you know, you guys have been making huge efforts to diversify and I'm, that's wonderful. That's part of why I'm so excited. And I would just, you know, I think I would be a really wonderful addition to your board. Uh, what do you think? Um, so I would point out that they have a problem, but not point it out in a way that makes them feel accused, uh, which is sort of annoying. But I, I think it, that's probably a, a more effective approach. And one thing I would do is I would find women on boards and reach out to them or find other people on the boards you want to work at. Because um, Sally Krawcheck, who is the CEO on Wall Street and one of the women I interviewed for the book, she said something really interesting. And I think about this all the time. Uh, she said, um, most of the decisions that made about you and your career are made when you're not in the room. Um, and she's like, so you need to have your own quote of little board of directors. But I think what that means in this context is if there's a board, reach out to the people on the board, ask to go to coffee, try to make connections. Um, I would say reach out to women first, but also reach out to men. Um, you never know who's going to be a champion and a mentor and a sponsor and just reach out to them and be like, I'd really love to be on this board. You know, it's really inspiring to me. If you find someone who's been a little activist-y, maybe that could be, or someone who's who's spoken out or is pushing for diversity on the board, reach out to them and be like, I really think it's so important what you're doing. I'd love to be a part of it. I'd really be interested in being on this board. What do you think? If they say, no, no, that's not possible. Be like, are there other boards that you might recommend um, for me? And just start like making those little inroads and those connections. And I think that can be helpful. But I'm really sorry about that because that sucks and it's not fair also. Well, a, a couple of questions that kind of go along with it are there, is there a way to change the corporate culture? Um, you know, what advice do you have to change the water that we're in and how do you know that it's, um, let's see, what was that other one that someone had asked? It was something similar. Yeah. So is there anything that we can change in the culture or the, the attitudes around us? Um, how, oh, how do you think we change attitudes to value the work? Oh, someone had asked about the pay gap related to women working in fields or roles that are female dominated. Um, and then how do we change those attitudes as well? I'm sorry. That was a couple questions. <laughs> no, no. Well, so there is a, a, a phenomenon that happens that it, when um, a field is dominated by women, that field tends to pay a lot less. And often if a field switches to being dominated by men to dominated by women, the pay will go down for that field. Um, the way to address that, that's an excellent question. That would, hmm. I mean, I think you have to like push to the higher salary range of those position or, yeah, I mean, I would recommend always aiming for the higher salary ranges. It is a little hard if you're in a field that tends to pay less. Um, that's like a bigger systemic issue. I feel like that's harder. Uh, as far as um, corporate culture, I think there's a lot you can do. One of the things is actually from uh, advice from Machiavelli, which um, I was very thrilled to see because it felt kind of inspiring, but he said a prince should always champion those less powerful than he is. Um, and Machiavelli recommended that because he said, 
if you if you sort of speak up to an authority or someone with a lot of power on behalf of people who are less powerful than you are, the person who has all the power and authority isn't going to be that mad at you because they'll be like, oh, he's so admirable. And the people who are less powerful you're speaking on behalf of will be very grateful and loyal to you. And I actually thought that was great. I mean, for Machiavelli, of course, it's very tactical advice. He's not doing it because he thinks it makes you a good person. But also I think in the workplace, that is one thing you can do. Wherever you are in the workplace, you have a certain amount of power. And I think championing, mentoring, reaching out to women, people of color, the marginalized workers are people who may, who you think have a lot of promise and you're excited about and help them navigate, you know, things. I think that can start to improve the culture. Um, and I think there's a lot, a lot of like young workers are really pushing for change. And so I think that can be a very powerful, a very powerful way to change things. And I, I think sometimes we tend to assume that like a younger person coming in or an intern, they don't have anything to offer us. We only have something to offer them. But I don't think that's true. I've seen people move up very quickly, very smart. And, and so also like younger workers pushing for change, they can be real allies that can help you out too. Um, and I think that can be a way to start to change the culture. And also just to sort of band together with the other, um, one of the, my favorite pieces of advice in the book it came from Dr. Tina Opie. Uh, she's a professor of management at Babson College, but she loved to do this thing. She was experiencing a situation in academia where she's being interrupted all the time and talked over and ideas stolen and all that. And she recommended something called amplification, which was um, the women in the Obama administration um, anonymously spoke to a reporter at the Washington Post about this tactic that they developed at the White House because they were having trouble being heard in the White House, which is very competitive. Um, and even though, you know, President Obama, I think, you know, it was a fairly woke president. Um, it was still a very male dominated atmosphere. So what the women did, and I think this can speak to transforming a whole culture as well as preventing interruption. But so one woman would say something like, Polly, you would say, I really think we need to start talking about uh, the, the cell phone project. And then I would jump in and say, you know, I think Polly, that's a great idea. I think um, Polly's cell phone project is a great idea. And someone else would jump in and say, you know, Stacey, I really agree. Uh, Polly's idea is amazing. And that was a way to sort of support, of like to create mutual support. And, and I think things like that can really actually, those conversations, supporting other people, um, I mean, I don't mean to say like, be the change you want to see in the world, but also a little bit, be the change you want to see in the world. It's hard. Like, it's easy to say it's a hard practice, especially if you're experiencing discrimination yourself, it can feel so, you know, frustrating and, and things like that. But I do think that can be incredibly empowering. I do think that can start to move the needle. And I do think that eventually, um, once women and people of color and other marginalized workers do start getting into management positions, which is happening and will happen, um, then I think policies will change, corporate, you know, corporate structures will change. And I do think big change will happen. But I think we're at this moment, the reason I think that data has been stuck for so long, even though there's been so much change, is that there's like a little bit of a log jam, like the like a clogged drain. But I think I think a bunch of things are probably going to change all at once, is what I think. But that's based on nothing, no data. There's that's just based on my <laughs> intuition. <laughs> Um, what do you see? We've had a couple people ask about, you know, where we go from here with wage inequality. Um, and now, especially with the pandemic um, setting us back, what do you see? For well, this? It, this is a really good moment as far as wages. This is the moment to ask for a raise because, raise, because wages are rising pretty much across the whole economy. Um, all yeah, all different job, different kinds of jobs are seeing pay increases. And workplaces are so desperate to keep workers that I think they're much more open to raises and paying higher salaries than they used to be. And I think also now companies are becoming much more concerned and aware of diversity and inclusion issues. So I do think this is a really important moment for, for women and people of color and traditionally marginalized workers and men and everyone to ask for a raise because wages really hadn't risen in this country um, 
for like 30 years. I mean, it's been a really long time. Like none of us have really gotten a raise, but we're getting a little raise now, even though prices are also rising, but that's another issue. Um, so I would push and I would ask, I think in every case, people should just like start asking around. And I think my friend's tactic of, you know, reaching out, she's like, I just reach out to white men on LinkedIn. Um, but I think that's a good, you know, I think that's actually a good tactic, but maybe reach out to like a large group of people to get an, a, a sense of what the range is. And then you can aim higher in the range. I mean, does this mean you're not going to experience more pushback than you would if you looked different? No, probably not. But you can, I think there is an awareness. I think the the planets are a little bit aligned to, to push for more right now. I think this is a really a really great moment. And we're all sort of navigating kind of this new situation that we're in. A lot of people are navigating coming back to work, coming back to the office or changing a work situation. So that can be a good sort of entree into, um, into a conversation about, well, speaking of this and like maybe, you know, if you're taking on new stuff or working in a different way, that can be sort of a good excuse to bring up money. I think that's great. Let's end that on the an optimistic note. And I think this is a, good, <laughs> a great place to stop. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much um, for speaking with us tonight, sharing your wisdom um, and your expertise. We so appreciate it. Um, you know, check out her book. It's wonderful. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. It was such a wonderful uh it was, I'm really honored.